In 1991, I photographed the paintings of Ajanta. These 5th century paintings which are hidden in the darkness of caves in Western India. These are the most revered and the most beautiful paintings of the entire Buddhist tradition. In all the countries of Asia, they speak reverentially of this site. The paintings of Ajanta changed my life. The gentle beings of the art permeated my consciousness. Every time I looked at the paintings, I was carried away. There was an infinite warmth, humility and compassion in these paintings. It was expressed in every gesture, in every glance. It was indeed a world of compassion which took me over completely. A journey began to discover the philosophy, the vision of life which underlies these great paintings. Leading experts on Buddhist art said that my photographs showed the Ajanta paintings in their true and luminous colours for the first time. Universities, museums and cultural institutions from around the world invited me to come and lecture on these paintings. Everywhere, people responded with warmth to the sensitivity and compassion contained in the art of Ajanta. These are in fact the very qualities which people associate with Buddhism. However, many asked questions about current practices in Buddhism, particularly in the Himalayan regions. These appear to be rather different from the early compassionate faith. Was this Buddhism really? How did these changes come about? Join me on a journey through the history of Buddhism. Let us see how these transformations took place in Buddhist practice. Gautama Siddharth was one of humanity's wisest teachers. He was born in 563 BCE, the son of Sudhodana, the ruler of the Shakya clan. Sudhodana ruled from the town of Kapilavastu in the present-day state of Uttar Pradesh in India. At the age of 35, Gautama attained Bodhi, the knowledge of the eternal truth. Gautama Siddharth taught a profound ethical message to the many followers who soon gathered around him. He spoke of the pain in our lives and pointed out that this was because of our own desires. The way to do away with the pain was to lose our desires. The majority of Buddhists belong to the earlier austere form of Theravada Buddhism. They believe that it is through self-discipline that they can give up worldly attachments to proceed on the path to salvation. There are also Mahayana Buddhists. They believe in Bodhisattvas. Bodhisattvas are beings on their way to enlightenment who have delayed their own salvation to help others on the path. Besides self-discipline and personal development in order to lose our confusions and desires, we can also pray to them for their help. And then there are the Vajrayana Buddhists in the Himalayan regions of India, in Tibet, southern China, Mongolia and in Japan. They appear to follow colourful and magical practices. They seem to be very far from the concepts of Buddhism as we understand them. The Cham dance of the Lamas signifies the victory of knowledge over ignorance. In Buddhist thought, the greatest evil is the ego. 
it is that sense of the self which is the greatest illusion which we must lose in order to gain true knowledge the masks cover the ordinary day to day nature of the men and present instead the qualities of the deities within them there are peaceful masks and those with wrathful expressions to understand the practices of the lamas and to understand the history of later buddhism we have to turn to nalanda and other universities of eastern india in the first millennium great buddhist monasteries were established in the plains of eastern india and in kashmir These were intellectual centers where the science of the mind was studied in great detail. The finest intellectuals analyzed the path, the steps on the path towards buddhahood or true knowledge. They sought to create a logical path which would lead us step by step towards that knowledge. A path which would work for all. These vast universities had hundreds of teachers and students who came from across India and from the many countries of Asia that had embraced Buddhist philosophy. The greatest of these was here at Nalanda. Here there was a spirit of vibrant intellectual thought, a climate of discussion and debate. This institution uh takshishila and nalanda and later brikamala shila now and then these uh, uh not like monastery uh but these really become academic center one of the most important universities in the world was developed not in the medieval west but right here in india And here I'm referring to the uh, the universe uh, the university consortium of Nalanda, Vikramashila, Somapura, Odantapuri. All of these various universities were instrumental in producing people who were capable of understanding and articulating what it means to have universal knowledge, knowledge that's applicable across cultures and across times. And really what we're talking about here when we're talking about revolution is a change in perspective. It's a complete change in the way we perceive and thus experience the world. This information might appear arcane or esoteric, but in fact, the most interesting thing about it is that it is very clearly about consciousness itself. It's about every one of us, and it's about in the end something quite simple. and that simple thing is the transformation of our negative impulses into their positive counterparts and this is the central doctrine of yoga tantra and anuttara yoga tantra as they were developed in the great universities of the indian plains in the medieval period the deities revered in tibet were conceived in the monasteries of eastern india The earliest known images of Tara are all to be found in the 5th 6th century Buddhist caves of Maharashtra. The first Buddhist mandala in art is seen in the mid 5th century Kanheri caves. The first 11-headed Avalokiteshvara is also seen in a 5th 6th century cave at Kanheri. religion is a word which is very um, uh, loose uh, uh, expression i don't know whether buddhism should be uh, put in the uh, uh, connotation of religion or not uh, if we are very strictly speaking the religion has its own uh, connotation buddhism is uh, different from all other religious tradition is that 
there's no place for uh, unanalyzed faith or something which is to be uh, accepted without any one's own understanding or one's own uh, uh, logical conclusions. Now you see the differences. Buddhism, like Jainism, we have no concept of creator. So one's own salvation must achieve through one's own effort. Now, uh, the main obstacle about salvation, salvation is ignorance. There are many level of, many different level of ignorance. So logically, the antidote of ignorance is knowledge, not prayer. And then also, you see, the basic Buddhist approach is from this level, uh, without sort of waiting blessing, <laughs> but one's own sort of effort, and step by step become Buddhahood. So therefore, uh, in order to uh, practice uh, effectively, we have to know about mind, about emotion. So therefore, the, those Buddhist texts also including some Hindu sort of tradition where practice of shamatha and vipassana there, naturally the explanation about mind automatically come. So therefore that part I consider science. So today, now last few years, I think over one decade, I think a number of Western medical scientist and also the uh, brain sort of scientist. Now they're really showing interest to get information, explanation from Eastern uh, Indian ancient thought about emotion, about mind. So they found very, very useful information uh, in order to know the reality about the world of emotion, world of mind. So that I consider as a science. Then concept, concept of impermanence, or concept of interdependency. This also itself is simply, so sort was of the out of their investigation or analyze the reality. Then they develop this sort of new uh, concept about re reality. <laughs> Now, in physics, also now they realize the atomic level. Every moment is changing, moving like that. Uh, one time, one of my friend, the Raja, Raja Ramana, Indian sort of nuclear physicist, once you see, he told me he found the concept of quantum physics found some of some of the Nagarjuna's sort of writing. So he, as an Indian, he feel very proud. The quantum physics in the, in the, in the, in the world is quite is new. Uh, but in ancient Indian thought, 2,000 years ago, already have this concept. So therefore, uh, these things, uh, not as a religious subject, but academic subject. Uh, so, is it these Nalanda master sort of writing really uh, useful for academic field? Well, something which is so unique of Nalanda University in terms of its knowledge and wisdom is the tremendous uh, logic, tremendous um, metaphysics, and the tremendous study of epistemology which are all utilized, which are all utilized to uh, bring about uh, incredible depth of the warmth in the human being. Studies ka jo philosophy ka kendra bana hai, wo sabse bara kendra shayt nalanda bana hai. 
और वहाँ के विद्वान लोगों ने मतलब जैसे हमने बोला डिबेट जो सिस्टम है जो कि जिसको हम लोग डिबेट में से ही बोलते हैं या इंग्लिश में डिबेट है तो डिबेट के माध्यम से वो ऐसा नहीं बल्कि जस्ट आपको इंट्रोड्यूस किया इसके बाद में आप उसको विचार में रख लिया इतना नहीं बल्कि एक एक पहलू पर और सालों सालों तक वो भी बड़े बड़े विद्वान लोग जो भी बहुत बुद्धिमान लोग एक एक पहलू को मेरा ख्याल से साल साल तक अध्ययन करके कुछ नतीजे पर पहुंच के इन्होंने इस फिलोसफी को इस इस ट्रेडिशन को आगे बढ़ाया है इंडियाज है गैलेक्सी ऑफ स्कॉलर्स दीज नालंदा स्पेशली द विक्रमशिला यूनिवर्सिटी वॉज द मैनी मैनी मज स्कॉलर्स इन इट इज़ वेरी डिफिकल्ट टू पिन पॉइंट दिस इज दी स्कॉलर न Nagarjuna has a very uh, you know a significant uh, place in Buddhist philosophy he has uh, as i see it uh, you know propounded the madhyamika philosophy uh, which is uh, the philosophy as demonstrated in the pragyaparamita sutra madhyamika is regarded to be the 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 highest school of thought in buddhism so in this in understanding the reality of the external and internal world it's very important uh, that uh, the philosophy of madhyamika tells us that uh, the entire world is uh, you know interdependent and they do not have any inherent existence they do not have any essential existence but they are interdependently originated then in the case of aranagarjuna so without such we establish monastic universities very big established monastic universities how come that one individual person can have such a you know coherent very precise and able to articulate these concepts so beautifully so how come that be possible and then likewise it is not just aranigarjuna then aranigarjuna student aridheva for example his uh, writing for understanders so you look at that there is such a richness so from these i got the you know i got the idea that oh at the time of aranigarjuna and aridheva they already must have been existing such a big monastic so well established monastic universities with a rich tradition which a long tradition of intellectual rigor and um, the depth and sophistication so from this um, i would say that nalanda university which the history tells that it was at time the the, the aranigarjuna i would say that should go you know even beyond aranigarjuna's time for example um the present day the uh, the phd students when they submit their thesis there's a particular you know sophistication in terms of formatting the thesis with footnotes and you know the major and the minor sources and then there's a, you know a particular methodology by which to to submit the, the thesis by which to write the thesis so if you if you, by chance if you find one you know uh, such a thesis which had to be, happened to be as old as 2000 years old then from there you can easily say that oh so look this is just exactly a copy you know or what we are doing now in a, the modern universities is exactly a copy of this one which existed 2000 years ago so from there we can easily infer that such a sophisticated universities what we have now was actually there 2000 years ago parampavan dalai lama ji beech beech mein kehte hain bharat jo hai tibet ka guru hai aisa unhone kehte hain kyunki जितना भी तिब्बत में जो धर्म के साथ में जो संस्कार आए हैं कल्चर आए हैं लैंग्वेज आए हैं मेडिसिन का जो हेल्थ केयर का है ये जितना भी कई चीज़ें तो इस तरह से भारत से आकर के आचार्य लोगों की कृपा से तिब्बत में आए हैं द हाई एल्टीट्यूड प्लेट ऑफ तिब्बत लाइंग टू द नॉर्थ ऑफ इंडिया received buddhism in the 7th century king songsten gampo had two wives who both followed the path of the buddha one queen was from nepal and the other was from china 
This led him to take a deep interest in the Buddhist faith. The most uh, overwhelmingly impressive and inspirational thing for me about um, the Tibetan traditions of Buddhism as received from India is the way in which those, those um, great masters of the past went to such incredible lengths to not only um, go and, and get those teachings and bring them to Tibet, but the, the masters, the, the Indian masters who travelled, went through incredible hardships and um, they were willing to put those lives on the line or even sacrifice those lives for the good or the benefit of this much greater vision um, in which the whole of humanity, um, particularly perhaps the Tibetan people in the case of, of bringing Buddhism to Tibet, but in a larger picture than that, the whole of humanity in preserving those traditions for the future, preserving the knowledge, the wisdom, the meditative practices, the Vajrayana, the Tantric practices, all those things, that, that great, great treasure of um, understanding and capacity for human beings to enlighten themselves. Uh, history says, uh, Dunkars uh, give the references, when the uh, Buddhism in Tibet uh, developed in two phases. Now, one is early phase, other is later phase. First phase began from 7th century to the, uh, to the end of the 9th century, means you know, 842 something like that. In this period, uh, from India, almost 51 scholars and the Panditas were invited. Then after a second phase of development, it is said that almost 121 uh, Indian scholars visited Tibet. They have contributed. They have revised the text which was earlier been translated. And then beside that, from time to time, it is believed there were almost, I think, uh, more than 600 Tibetans who visited India in a, in a time span of thousand years to learn Buddhism and bring back whatever they have learned in India. Tibet did not have a written script till the 7th century. The acceptance of the Buddhist faith entailed the understanding of subtle philosophic concepts and profound commentaries. This transfer of knowledge would not have been possible without translating and writing it down. A very sophisticated language and a script capable of preserving this knowledge had to be formulated. Oh yes, Tibetan language or oh, script is very much copy and very much similar. Oh because it based on one of the ancient Indian script. Once Buddhism reached Tibet and started translation, then the vocabulary, which in Buddhist tradition, then uh, translated into Tibetan, uh, not available in Tibetan language, so created new words. So therefore, eventually, the Sanskrit vocabulary or Sanskrit terminology and Tibetan terminology go exactly the same. Thommi Samuta created language at par with the Sanskrit because he was to translate those Sanskrit texts into the Tibetan. So Sanskrit language itself is a very, very, uh, very, very highly elaborated and a very systematic language. You know. uh, to come at par with the, this language was not easy. You know. To create this, uh, this kind of uh, language was not easy. You know. In Sanskrit, all kind of human learning is being, uh, being, being recorded. Whether it's a medicine, whether it's a philosophy, whether it's a language, whether it's a art, whether it's a poetry, every human learning, that terminology need to be translated into that newly created language. This is important. So what the Thunmi did in Naki, he has tried to create the Tibetan grammar as a Panini grammar. So what he did in Naki, putting this suffix and prefix word, that are the basic things, you know, through which in Sanskrit also suffix, pratya and upsarga. When you put together the meaning changes you now, and they also created same kind of suffix and prefix word in Tibetan language. 
So this language became potent enough to translate Sanskrit word into Tibetan in exactly in the same meaning and the same purpose. The translations are done word by word and sentences by sentences. So therefore, this precision that is maintained in Tibetan is unparalleled. It was in the 8th century that Acharya Shanta Rakshita of the Nalanda University was invited to Tibet to teach Buddhism. He brought with him a great system of monastic teaching which was based upon a deep study of the principles of logic. He taught the Tibetans to focus on fundamental concepts such as what is our knowledge based upon? What is knowledge itself? The Acharya Shandrachit, the first person who established Buddhism in Tibet, and he emphasized the Tibetan people to learn the Buddhism not by faith, but uh, by reasoning, by logician, and by um, analyzing the things for, for oneself. As uh, Buddha had told, not to believe uh, which has been said by Buddha, but to understand by oneself through uh, analyzation and through um, uh, a rational mind. There were some practitioners, but there were no tradition of monkhood in Tibet, in Tibetan community. So Shanta Rakshit, has greatest contribution in establishing the monastic community in Tibet. So what he did was that while the, the richness, the main content of this whole legacy, which is in the form of philosophy, so that he started to impart by means of the logic. So he, he introduced logic there in Tibet. So with this study of logic, then you can't really escape. You can't really have room for diluting the concept. So the logic is like a very precise container. So with this container, you can see what is really there. The measurement is so accurate. So there, the philosophy, which is like the content of this con the con container of the logic, it was so you know, you know, freshly preserved in uh, Tibet. So, then it happened in 8th century, so now it's 21st century, already like, say, uh, 13th century is gone. Still, you go to the, the great monastic universities in South India, Tibet, the monastic universities, there the amount of the, the rigor involved in terms of logic, study of logic, amount of the rigor and the subtlety, subtle nuances involved in the study of philosophy This tradition, which started like a thousand years ago, it, it can go so well, it can go so fittingly with the contemporary uh, present day uh, academic standards. So uh, I would say, if not better, surely it's not, not less. So this is an uh, the amazing tradition, which I think the you know, Indians should really take pride in it. This is the legacy, this is the treasure of India. So I think the Tibetan quite a fond, you see, use Nalanda name. Now, for example, the last, I think, about 600 years, uh, I think less than 600 years, the Debu Monastery, the biggest uh, number of monk students, uh, I think all over Tibet. So usually we call Tibetan Nalanda. <laughs> Usually, you see, we call it. We fond, you see, fond, fond, you see, to use, uh, describe it that way. So uh, then, important is another important. All the text, which I think, Gaji, Nyingma, Saja, Gilu, and Chana, all these, I think, a major tradition. <coughs> the, among the follower of this tradition, they all you should study the text which wrote by Nalanda masters like Nagarjuna, Buddhapalita, Aryandeva, uh, Vabhavika, and Chandakirti, uh, Dignak, and
Arya Asanga, Bosuband, Dingna Dharma Kirti, and the Chanda Kirti, and then like Naroba. All these uh, formerly Nalanda scholars. So all Tibetan tradition, you see, come from each different tradition. They are original sort of masters. All come from Nalanda. So I usually used to describe Tibetan Buddhist tradition is a pure lineage of Nalanda tradition. So I also, you see, uh, start from age from six, seven, already start memorizing uh, these uh, texts of Nalanda. At that time, I do not know <laughs> who, 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 who is the author of these texts and come from, come from uh, which sort of was the uh, uh, institution. I have no idea. Atisha was another great teacher who was persuaded to go to Tibet in the 11th century. He had studied at Nalanda and was a teacher at the Vikramshila University, also in Bihar. He helped to make the philosophy understandable to common Tibetans. Once Atisha was in Tibet, he was so impressed by the devotion of the Tibetan people and the need of great scholar like him in the Tibet. So he chose to remain in Tibet rather than going back to India. And Tibetans are very grateful for his decision. Perhaps his unique genius was to be able to take all of this very esoteric information and condense it into a form that could be understood and used by anyone. Another very interesting aspect of universal knowledge is that it can be condensed and transported. Atisha was also instrumental in the condensation of this knowledge so that it could be taken out of the university context, perhaps transported into another culture, and then take root. And this is one of the things that happened in uh, Tibet in the 11th century. He was uh, amazingly learned and um, his, uh, his signature kind of text um, the light to the path, the lamp to the path to enlightenment. This um, text formed the basis for the, uh, the later school of the Gelugpas uh, under Tsongkhapa and, the, and formed the basis for the gradual path to enlightenment, the Lam Rim, that, that became the, the signature of that school. And this particular um, path you know, became of such huge uh, importance in Tibet. And yet, Atisha was one master of um, many in India. And I think perhaps the, we, when you consider those, that lineage of masters that came, um, you can say that uh, they must have represented a very small number of those who were in existence in India at the time. And yet, um, those masters in, in Tibet now, whose works have continued, uh, have been preserved there in a way which, in which Indian Buddhism wasn't preserved in, in India. And so, um, in that sense, the Tibetans have played a, a, a hugely important role uh, for, the, for the planet, if you consider these teachings of great value. So the gist of the idea is that we all seek happiness. We all like to avoid suffering. Now the question is, how can we do that? How can we do that? And in fact, originally the Buddha said that all these sufferings that we, that we encounter with, the root is the ego. The root is the ignorance which distorts the perception of the reality. Then, this is the trigger point from which the whole philosophy, the logic and everything of Buddhism came out. As Buddha pointed out, then Aranigarjuna elaborated, saying that this ignorance, it is like you in a dream. So now all these great masters in the different traditions of Buddhism, they were trying to explain what is dream like. 
it was such a wonderful tradition, you know. And uh, debating with someone else, it is not considered as an offense, you know. This is more like a kind of tradition. And this, I think, is the real strength of knowledge. In fact, this is the greatest avenue whereby uh, there is the, the development of the knowledge happening. We know about a few of the great teachers of the Nalanda University owing to the writings of the Tibetans. What a place Nalanda must have been and what a great society it must have been out of which all this was born. A society which gave so much importance to rational thinking and the logical search for knowledge. Truly an intellectual society. Nalanda may have produced thousands of great scholars throughout the time. His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, has enlisted 17 kind of leading uh, outstanding scholars of Nalanda Monastery throughout the time. And uh, he composed a prayer uh, to all those 17 outstanding scholars. Uh, firstly, I wrote poem praising each, uh, each of the master. I made clear each <laughs> <coughs> sort of scholars, special field, speciality, then made set of these masters, Tanga painting. The universities of, uh, of the plains of Bihar in medieval India had to have been incredible places to be at the time. When you think about the thousands and thousands of monks and scholars that were concerned with the most important things every day, year in and year out, we must understand that there was something incredibly special going on here. This was not a pastime. These were the most important aspects of human experience that were being developed, concentrated on, for the good of humanity. Imagine something like that. Here in the modern world, we're used to thinking of everything as being marketing-driven and money-driven. This instead is being driven by the evolution of consciousness, the growth of consciousness, the growth of compassion. I think uh, since Buddhism flourished in Tibet, a uh, whole Tibetan way of life changed. Buddha come from India. So therefore, we Tibetan, you see, look India as something uh, Arya Bhumi. Uh, a very sacred sort of land. Tibetan, then you should consider uh, such Tibetan who once you see, went to India, uh, some study and speak Sanskrit or Pali, and they have you see, a little bit sort of higher uh, status. India, sacred land. Anything from India uh, is something very sacred very holy. The monasteries re-established in South India are of the uh, larger monastic institutions in Tibet. And they continue the traditional study of the uh, uh, all uh, uh, three Pitak uh, through its uh, commentaries and uh, particularly his Holiness has uh, uh, named out 17 uh, Nalanda scholars who have written uh, uh, most important commentaries on the Buddha's teaching and which are studied in uh, South Indian monasteries. It's very important to have uh, contemplation, discussion and the debates. If we do debate, with a kind of uh, an intention to just to win and to just to defeat someone. And that kind of uh, uh, approach really doesn't help that much to uh, make the debate productive. The Tibetan Buddhist scholars has learned this 
approach of the Nalanda scholars. And then, upon that, a great contribution the Tibetans had added up is the way of debate that you see at present day. You see nowadays, the monks, when they do the debate, they clap. They are very fixed votes to ask questions and answer those questions. Buddha himself, you see, uh, or see they advise us, oh, my follower, bhikshus and scholars should not accept my teaching out of faith and devotion, but rather through thorough investigation and experiment. So that way of approach is, I think, very suitable in modern time. And the scientific-minded people, you see, loves that kind of way of approach. Uh, so perhaps I think in modern time, uh, you see, people who uh, not easily sort of accept things, rather sort of, through investigation, experiment. So uh, such people find the Buddhist way of approach is more realistic, more practical. When we uh, talk about religion from the Western approach, they have a different uh, kind of uh, connotation of it. But when we talk about the religion from Indian approach, uh, that's, uh, that means something different. In the Indic civilizations, I think one could go much wider and much deeper. You could ask questions, why are we here? What is the nature of God? What is the nature of the self? What is the purpose of human existence? You know, these things are, uh, are, are the subject of, of great dialogues. It's much closer to the Socratic dialogues. The Socratic uh, Plato dialogues uh, are very much of the same pattern as the Indic dialogues. Yoga, remember, is the most fundamental and profound study into the human mind ever undertaken. And modern psychoanalysis is only just beginning to touch the fringes of what... The, I'm not talking when I talk of yoga, not only the exercises, which, which are known as yoga generally, but of the much deeper yoga, the inner yoga, the study of consciousness. That is something, I think, that the West can learn a lot from India. His Holiness the Dalai Lama, His Holiness puts it so beautifully. If you understand this, the wisdom of interdependency as taught in the Nalanda University teachings, then you may not be a Buddhist. You can be you know, Hindu, you can be Christian, but you will be a wonderful Christian. And you will be uh, you know, the environmentalist, you will be a wonderful environmentalist. So this knowledge is a pure knowledge. It has nothing to do with dogma. It has nothing to do with, you know, uh, a religion as such. So therefore, I call it as a legacy of India, the legacy of the world. So it must not disappear. It must remain for long. The search for the truth was not restricted to the universities of ancient and medieval India. It was shared by the common people even till recently, you could have a sophisticated intellectual discussion about Maya or Mithya, the illusory nature of the material world around us, with even the most common Indians. India is an extraordinary country. Mother India, really, Mother India. India is one of the most religious, wrong word, the most spiritual countries on earth. Because Indian people have a very deep understanding of the spiritual life. Scratch an Indian, you can have a spiritual discussion. It's absolutely extraordinary. It doesn't matter who you meet, taxi driver to a, a, a cabinet minister. Absolutely universal situation. The benefit of the Buddhist culture is that Buddhism promotes tolerance, it promotes learning, it promotes spirituality in collaboration with technical progress rather than spirituality standing against technical progress, which has been such a problem as the world modernizes. And it's trying to get those two forces side by side. In the history of human civilization, 
India has been one of the great originators of culture and religion. Uh, Indian culture has done for the East what the Greek and Roman culture together did for the West. And therefore you will find all the way from Afghanistan to uh, Indonesia and all the way to Japan and China and Korea and all the countries of South and Southeast Asia has the impact of Indian culture on their language, on their customs, on their art, on their music. Uh, it has been an extraordinary saga. One of the great miracles in the story of man is the spread of ideas across formidable natural barriers of high mountains and vast seas. Ideas do not know political and national boundaries. The ready acceptance of the ideas of life by the people of faraway lands underlies the sameness of human life and the human condition everywhere. Perhaps the greatest example of the travel of ideas is the vast spread of the Indic concepts of Buddhism and Hinduism in ancient times. These ideas were warmly accepted wherever they went. From Sri Lanka in the south to Mongolia in the north, from the river Volga in the west to Japan in the east. This spread was not through military conquests, but simply through Indian traders. The people who heard them talking about philosophical matters wished to know more. Here was a philosophic vision which appeared to bring peace and happiness in one's life. Therefore, Indian teachers were cherished and sought. So therefore, I always describe, or when I met Indian, I always say, you are traditionally our guru. We are Chela. You Indian are our guru. Uh, then also I mentioned, we, we Tibetan, not only Indian gurus Chela, but also quite reliable Chela. That means in guru's own land, uh, Buddha Dharma, a lot of ups and downs. During this period, we, your chela, kept. Throughout, you see, through, through centuries, we kept your knowledge intact. So we are quite a reliable chela. <laughs> so our relation is something very unique, guru and chela. Uh.